Uh, good afternoon. A great day in the state of Washington. Uh, I do want to uh, resolve an issue. I've been asked several times who I voted for for the Naismith uh, NC2A Basketball Player of the Year Award, and that went to Drew Timmy. Um, happy to do that. Great to see the Zags yet again in a magnificent performance. Congratulations, Washington State Cougar women who won a conference championship. Great season. Things are going well uh, on the hard court in Washington State. So um, I'm actually very pleased the way this session is going at, at this moment. The House and Senate have, are making great progress on quite a number of things, including behavioral health, early learning, special education, and climate. A lot of great things, I believe, are going to get done uh, this year. I'm very pleased about the direction and pace of the legislative session. We know we have more work to do on a number of issues, including our homelessness crisis in the state of Washington. We know that we have over 25,000 people unhoused in the state of Washington. We know we're going to have to build over a million homes uh, in the next 20 years. I do believe uh, that we need to go big on housing this year uh, so that uh, people can go home. You need to go big so people can go home is the bottom line. And I think we have a sense of what going big means by looking at what we've done in the recent past in the current situation in the state of Washington. In the last biennium, we invested over $800 million in housing, and yet we still have this chronic problem uh, on our streets across the state of Washington. So we know in order to really move the needle, we need to do more than $800 million, and I am asking the legislators to do that. Uh, we do have a good start on that discussion. Uh, I want to credit the Senate. They have put uh, real increases in their proposal in state funds. But we do know that the scale of this situation, we do know that we'll need to do more than we did last biennium rather than less. So I look forward to continuing discussion. I'm hopeful that the House will, in their budget that comes out next week, produce a larger number. And then we'll have some good discussion uh, between the chambers and the governor's office. On the policy side, I, I am pleased at the current status to try to uh, adopt policies that will open up more areas to actually build this housing. There are multiple policies that are advancing, including transit-oriented uh, development uh, bills, uh, what we call the middle housing bill, permitting assistance to cities and counties so they can permit new building more rapidly. Uh, we're getting good progress on this, and I appreciate the legislators working through these complex uh, issues. But I, I do want to say this, though. Uh, I, I think we're going to come out with some good bills about increasing the available places we can build housing. But those will not be sufficient by a country mile. We do need uh, very significant public investment. And that's why I'm committed uh, to make sure that we do that, because the private sector simply will not have the capital available for homeless people and working families who are now getting squeezed out by uh, raising rents. Uh, here's some more good news. Labor and Industries has opened up public comments on their policies for protecting outdoor workers from extreme heat. This is a growing problem in our state. Some of the hard working, hardest working people in the state are now being exposed to increasing temperatures because of climate change. This will give them increased protection against heat exposure. It builds on a policy we started two years ago, and I'm glad Ellen and I is making progress on this. More good news on the front for our working families tax credit. As you know, this is a policy that can make available to over 120,000 households uh, essentially a break on your taxes by getting a rebate. Uh, and there has been $52 million of these rebates already with an average rebate of between seven and $800. So this uh, program is off to a, a very rapid start. And uh, uh, if, you wanna, if you'd like to find out if you're eligible, you can go to the workingfamiliescredit.wa.gov, workingfamiliescredit.wa.gov, to check out uh, if you're eligible. Big deal for a lot of really hardworking uh, working families. So that's a quick report, and happy to stand for your questions. Should we Go down this way, or what do you guys want to do? I got, I got a hand here. Let's, okay, let's go with the first taker here. I'll start. Um, Governor, uh, yesterday, Andy Billy basically criticized the facts that you gave at the homeless encampment when you had that little briefing there about the Senate proposal for housing, that it was not 
they they had a lot of money. It was a lot more, and your eight hundred million was incorrect. Do you care to respond to that? Well, yes, uh, we did invest over eight hundred million dollars. I think here's where the complexity comes in. The state of Washington invested over eight hundred million dollars in housing. The sources of that money, some was from the general fund, from the tax base of the state of Washington, some was from federal grants. But the federal grants have now disappeared post-COVID. So we have to figure out a way to replace that and go in excess of $800 million. And I believe we do need to go in excess of $800 million. When you try to scale and you try to think, what is the right scale for investment that we need to make? The one thing I know for sure is it's in excess of $800 million. Because if you invest $800 million, we know what we get. We still have a housing crisis because we have more people coming in. We're not building enough housing. So it's clear to me that we have to, from all sources combined, come up with more than $800 million. Unfortunately, we don't have those federal grants available to us anymore. Now, the Senate did increase their state from, what, from the general fund. They did propose increasing from what they had done in the past. Uh, by several hundred million dollars, which is good. I want to give them a credit for that. But because of the uh, disappearance of the federal dollars and the scope and scale of this crisis, it is clear to me that we are going to be bedeviled by the scourge of homelessness if we do not invest over $800 million. I think that is very, very clear. So I want to, again, give credit to the work they've done. They've started this discussion. I've made a proposal on how to finance that with this bond, which has very, very uh, wide approval. And so that's one of the ways to finance this. I commend it to the Senate. We'll see what the House does. They may look at this or some other proposal. But one way or another, we need to have a scale at, at, that, uh, at that rate. Can I just do a follow-up? Yeah. Uh, just in terms of your $4 billion plan, uh, do you have a plan B now that the revenue forecast came out and in the next two bienniums it's going to be down lower than what the forecast was? And you had been talking about possibly a, a method of not having a levy go to the public vote. What do you see from that forecast? And do you have do you do believe the, the levy will go to the public vote or do you have a plan B? Well, uh, I, I believe this would be widely accepted by the public. And there's good polling on this that we can share with you to show that, you know, by large, large majorities, public, the public believes we have a housing crisis, and they believe this is a realistic approach. So I'm very confident it would pass. And I guess, you know, one of my questions to the legislators is, what's wrong with letting the people make this decision? We're simply asking the legislators to let voters make this decision at the ballot box. I don't think we should fear the voters on that. So I'm happy to, to give that to the voters for a decision. Uh, so I'm just very confident it would pass. And I think that this is getting further consideration. We'll see what the House does. Uh, I can't tell you what they're going to do yet. We all have to remain at, uh, uh, in suspense for a few more days in this regard. But I, I feel uh, fairly confident they are going to be more aggressive on this. And then we'll start discussions to find out what options uh, exist. You said go, go big or go home. It almost, I think I know what you meant by that, but does it, are you drawing a line here where you would say, we're not going to adjourn this legislature or go into a special session potentially if they don't reach the mark that you've put down? Uh, no, it's too early to be talking in those terms, actually. And actually, the, the quote, which uh, I, I shamelessly plagiarized from a great writer at the Tacoma News Tribune, actually is we need to go big so people can go home. I originally had said we need to go big or go home. He actually said the better quote is go big so people can go home. And I, and I believe that's what we're trying to say here. But I think people do know how intensely uh, I believe Washingtonians want a solution to this homelessness crisis. I believe people feel it very deeply, both from a sense of frustration of seeing this in their neighborhoods and, and in these terribly unhygienic conditions, and of a sense of frustration and to some degree anger, but also from a sense of compassion of, of seeing people having to live in these conditions. You know, it's really interesting. I had a discussion yesterday with a woman uh, down at Wagner's at lunch. Trudy and I had a minute for lunch. And she says, you know, um, I just am a, of two minds about this homelessness crisis. And I asked her what she meant. She said, well, 
half the time I'm really, really angry at people who are living there, who are putting their trash out, and I have to look at it all the time, and it just, it just, it makes me angry. And then two minutes later, I feel compassion for the people thinking, geez, that could be my son who has a mental health problem living like that. And it's just, it just hurts my heart to think that we have so many people having to live in those conditions. Some who have untreated mental health problems, some who need drug treatment, and we have to assure that they get drug treatment. But if you're going to do mental health or drug treatment, it works a lot best if you're under a roof instead of a blue tarp. And so her, her comments, I thought, captured the sentiments, I think, Washingtonians. At one moment, being frustrated of seeing it, and another moment, having a sense of compassion of, of not allowing people having to, to live like that. And I thought that kind of captured a lot of people's sentiment. Governor, two questions for you. One of them on housing. I know some lawmakers have had concerns with the bond of uh, taking on too much debt in the state. I know the yeah. state treasurer said something about that too, concerns about the debt ratio. What would you, what would be your response to that? And then the second question, the Annie definition we could put out a new, the Rand new report on anti-Semitic incidents uh, this week. Uh, Washington hit a new high, Oregon hit a new high, and uh, for the third time in five years, uh, there's been a record number around the United States of harassment and attacks and stuff. I'd just be curious to get your broad uh, response to that. Well, first off, to the anti-Semitism, it has increased, and it is super uh, disturbing to us because this has been a, a multi-century uh, virus of hate that has affected humankind for in so many uh, methods, so many ways, in so many places. It continues, and all of us need to speak out against it as much as we can and, and wrap uh, our arms around this particular community. It is not the only kind of hate, but it is a virulent hate that has persisted for so many centuries that we have to be particularly um, uh, speaking against it. And I will and, con and will continue um, to do so. On the on the um, the bond, look what this is is it's it's like a mortgage when you buy a house, you get a mortgage, you sign a bond, you sign a, an instrument, and then you build a house, and you have a house at the end of the process. That's what we're doing here. We're buying a house, and the good thing about it is when you issue a bond, and then you build a house, that money doesn't just disappear. You have a house. You have an apartment building. You have rapid transitional housing. You have an asset. So basically, we are having some debt, as we do when you buy a house, and at the end of the day, you've got something for your money. So when we build a low-income housing program, I went to one in Bellevue the other day that's about 400 units. That is an asset that's going to be here for decades. That's the first thing I want to say, because some people think that this just kind of evaporates. No, we're creating a value for the state of Washington. That's number one. Number two, we're doing it at a rate that is, that is not abnormal. I want to repeat this. This rate of borrowing is not abnormal for the state of Washington. I will distribute a graph to you that will show that it is an extremely modest increase in, in the, the, the average uh, uh, debt service that we've had. Over the last 20 years, it's averaged our debt service as a percentage of the revenues is averaged about 5.5. This would go up to like 6.1. Very marginal increase. And, and it will be about six, it'll be about 5.75 had we not even done the bond. So there's very little difference. This is something that is cons largely consistent with what we've done. For the, in the first 10 years of this century, of this uh, century our, we were between six and seven percent. So this is not out of the range of ordinary behavior for the state of Washington. It is very easily accommodated. There could be some additional borrowing costs, as there is when you borrow money. But we do it for a good purpose. This is a crisis. This is a scourge. And it's going to get worse if we don't act. So uh, I think it is well worth it uh, to act in a, in, a, in, in a way that is consistent with what we've done uh, previously. The state of Washington has a good bond rating, in part, because we have such good, pen our pensions are so well funded. We're very fortunate. Uh, and because people recognize we've been so responsible, uh, we have a very good bond rating. Could it change? It's possible. But if it changes back to something that we had the first nine years of my governorship, we managed to run the state quite well, thank you, with that bond rating. So I think this is a very, very 
almost status quo approach uh, that we have. Now, if there are other ways to finance this, I am open to other ways to finance this. I have proposed one way to do it, which is this bond. I thought and continue to think it is the most likely thing to be able to get through both chambers ultimately. Uh, but if there are other means of financing that, I'm open to other ideas. Governor, the Senate budget release today puts almost $3 billion into education, which I believe is close to what your uh, proposal had as well. Senator Rolfe has said that she thinks this will help some school districts avoid perhaps school closures and layoffs. But she said the big problem remains the student loss, not just learning loss, but student loss. Anything the, st the state can do to get those students that were <coughs> lost during the pandemic and years leading up to that back in the classroom to help help pay those pay those bills off? Well, we can uh, continue to hire great teachers, and we've got a lot of efforts to do that. Uh, both our budgets have a teacher pay raise to help attract good people into the profession. We can help in every way we can. Uh, uh, for teacher training, which we've done uh, significantly. But I think we and with $3 billion is a pretty good way to help, too. So I have proposed uh, a little over $3 billion of additional funding for our schools. I haven't seen, I haven't actually been able to see the Senate budget. It just came out, but I understand they're somewhat in the same league. So that is not an insignificant sum of money. But I do think you have to realize we're coming through a period of adjustment post-COVID. So during COVID, there was actually an increase in the staffing levels of schools, even though there was a decrease in students to try to accommodate this new way of trying to do business for a year or two. And now we're going to, in, with continuing uh, decrease in enrollment, the, there, there is going to have to be some transition in the school districts. And that's just the nature of coming out of COVID, if you will. So we'll continue to do some work. Both our budgets have increases for special education to try to increase special education funding. So I think these are going to be solid efforts to try to ameliorate this transition that, that we're going through. Uh, Speaker Jenkins said yesterday the wealth tax most likely won't be heard this session. Are you disappointed by that? No, I didn't propose it. So I can't say I'm disappointed because I didn't propose it. Um, I think we've got some. It would add, obviously, add more money to. I'm sorry. It would add more money, obviously, to to the state spending. Right, but I can't be disappointed for something I didn't advocate. <laughs> so I can't. I cannot uh, express that. But I will say again. I, I think it's clear that we do have to find some additional funds available to deal with this housing crisis. There's a lot of problems you can solve without additional dollars, but this is not one of them. We have 25,000 people that are unhoused. We have proposed a $4 billion project that would house something around 22,000 people over the next several years of a building project. You can't build those houses without dollars. And you can't expect people just to vaporize. They're here. They're Washingtonians. They need a place to live. And the only way they're going to get a place to live is if we build some more houses in the state of Washington. That takes dollars. And so there has to be some additional source of, of, of funds to actually fund this very, very large. This is not a small investment. It has to be a large investment or this is going to be devilish. Now, we're not the only community that are affected by this. Many, many other states are affected by this, this homelessness problem. But nobody's going to get out of it without building more housing. And the private equity markets are not going to build this housing for low-income people. They won't even build it for working family people and have rents that are affordable. By the way, this is not just an issue for the people where today we're seeing in the street corners who might have mental health issues, might have drug addiction problems. It's also to help the people who are teachers, who are living four to an apartment in King County, and, 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 and bus drivers and truck drivers who can't afford to rent in western Washington. It's for them, too, because the private market is not building enough housing where rents are low enough where they can afford a place to live. So this is for people who are working, who don't have mental health, who don't have a drug problem, but they need a place to live. So um, we, we have to make that investment. We're not going to be able to make that investment unless there is some additional fund available of some nature, because we don't want to 
reduce the money going to the public education system. We need $3 billion more. We shouldn't cut higher education dramatically. We know we have to make large investments in mental health as well. So there's not a lot of dimes under the cushion to solve this problem. It does need additional revenues from some source. Yeah. Governor, I was wondering if you had any thoughts about uh, Senator, Senate Majority Leader Andy Billig's uh, Senate Bill 5447, uh, which would create a preferred business and occupation tax rate for large biofuel producers. Uh, that bill still has a 20 million gallon threshold. I was wondering if uh, you had any thoughts about whether that threshold is too high or better still, uh, what the state can do to help uh, smaller uh, renewable energy startups that aren't producing 20 million a year. Well, to start with, I have huge respect for Senator Billig, so most of ideas, his ideas I, I agree with. Uh, I'm a great proponent for biofuels and would generally be supportive of ways to enhance the growth of that industry. I haven't taken a, I don't think I've taken a specific position on the question that you have asked me, so I'll have to get back to you on that. I do want to point out we've had some really great news. British Petroleum and Anacortes has just announced a, a very large investment for biofuel, increasing aviation biofuels. So we can run our jets on, on biofuels grown with products that we grow right here in, in the topsoil. So I'm very excited about that. Uh, but I'll try to get you back to you on your specific question. Governor, if the bond isn't the right mechanism for raising revenue for housing, would you support a different revenue source? And if so, what would that be? So I haven't taken a position on any other proposal, so this is not an endorsement. Uh, I am advised that the House is looking at some uh, other proposal. Uh, I don't know whether they will advance it or not. I've got a reserve judgment on it, but I'm not ruling out other, other sources of revenue. What I'm saying is we have to make this investment. I cannot believe that the Evergreen State is going to become the ever homeless state. I just can't believe that that's the destiny of the state of Washington. So this is an absolutely necessary level of investment, and we have to find a way to, uh, to pay for it. So if the bond is not the mechanism, uh, I will be open to other ideas uh, on how, how to do that. Now, there's an increase in the excise tax for certain high-value homes that I've heard they've had some talk about. I'm not ruling that out at all. But one way or another, we have to find a way to finance this necessary investment. It is a crisis. Governor, is there a chance then, kind of going, I guess, off of Jim's question earlier, that you wouldn't sign a capital budget if it didn't hit a certain threshold for that housing investment? Well, I appreciate the tenor of your question, but I just think at this point, this is not the moment where the governor feels it's helpful to kind of issue what are called threats <laughs> in, in the nomenclature of the legislature. Uh, but what I will say, though, that, uh, you know, I'm fifth or sixth generation Washingtonian, depending on how you count. And I will, uh, legislators do need to know how passionately I feel about this subject because I feel that this is a, a, a real uh, dark moment for the state of Washington to think that we could become a state where this is a permanent condition, that we would accept this. I've been to nation, other nations that accept this. This is in other nations that has become just background noise to see hundreds of thousands of people living in the streets. And they just think, well, that's just, a, we, we just accept this. This is good enough for us. I don't, I think we're a better state than this. I think that we are at a why in the road of whether we're going to say we're going to refuse to accept this uh, or whether we're just going to sweep it under the rug. And you don't sweep this under the rug because it's so visible to start with. So I am very committed to this, and I'm asking the legislators to dig deep and, and, and join me in this leadership position in some other way. And this is early in the process, actually, and I'm glad that I think both chambers are seriously thinking about this. Again, the Senate has made some improvement on what the state has contributed, even though it's less than what we actually did last year, and we need to do more. So I think they know how committed I am to it. Governor, um, the latest IPCC report came out on Monday. Uh, what are your general thoughts on that, and do you think um, Washington's on track to meet the goals that were recommended in the report? Well, I have a lot of thoughts about this. It won't surprise you. My first one was I wish people would have listened to 
some of us back in 1992, we would have been in a lot better shape. But thank goodness Washington State now has taken real action. I'm really glad our first auction went well on the Climate Commitment Act. Um, uh, we're moving forward on getting people heat pumps, electric cars, batteries, the whole nine yards. We're making tremendous progress. I'm very proud of our state. I do believe we do have the best climate change and clean energy policies in the United States. All of, we're, all of those cylinders are, cylinders are clicking. Uh, there's no major roadblocks in any of the policies that we've rolled out. So I'm very, very proud of our state. But if you read the IPCC report, it, it'll just blow you away as to what we're looking at. The pace of this monster continues to accelerate, and that means we, we have to continue to accelerate our issues. So we're always looking for ways to accelerate our efforts in the state of, state of Washington. So my thoughts are really proud of our state and really committed to always look for new opportunities. Now, the state hasn't historically... Oh, by the way, excuse me, Jim, you asked another question, too. You asked... Oh, I just asked general thoughts uh, about the report itself, and... I thought you asked me a second question, but anyway. <laughs> when the state hasn't met its... Oh, no, you asked me how we're doing. You, you did ask me two oh. questions. <laughs> yeah, no, um, so uh, as far as implementation of the policies we adopted, I think we're just exactly where we want to be. They all seem to be working. We, there's no, like, major uh, uh, sticking points on them. But we have just kind of started to implement them. So uh, these things are just getting going. So our CO2 emissions have not been restrained in any really meaningful way in the last few years because we, we just finally have started to implement these policies. But I'm confident they are going to work. I think they are working, actually. People are getting access to new technologies that they love, including electric cars. They're just, they're just buying them like hotcakes. Uh, uh, heat pumps are coming on uh, like gangbusters. These things are working. Uh, the, the cost of solar and wind power continues to come down dramatically in the state of Washington. And as you've heard me say many times, the job creation has been prolific in our state. I look at the two silicon anode battery companies going into Moses Lake. One of the joys of this, too, it's not just in Seattle or Tacoma. It's in Moses Lake where we have the two silicon anode battery companies uh, uh, coming in. We're starting to make polysilicate uh, or silane gas again. Um, so all of that is just really thrilling to me that it's happening so fast. Last question, Jim. Governor, um, you talk about the state's progress. Are you, are you, does that include state government's own, own progress? I think I saw a report recently that the state hasn't met its, and I haven't double-checked this, but met its own goals for having your state agencies meet targets for buying electric cars. Yeah. Yeah, no, we, 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 as I've said, we need, we have just started to implement these policies. So that's why we have to pedal faster. On this, on the electric car uh, uh, issue, we got to have more charging stations. So we have found we need, a, we need appropriations to get more charging stations so that when somebody, a CPS worker, drives the OMAC, they can charge their car. So even though we get the car, we have to get the charging station. And that, I haven't looked at the Senate budget yet, but I'm really glad that we have profound money coming in from the Climate Commitment Act that we can use for that charging station infrastructure so we can meet uh, our state goals in this regard. That's the kind of thing where we need to move, we need to move faster. Fourth term? I got to ask you for your advice. For, I mean, you know, until I get advice from this group, I, you just never know. I got some advice from the Seattle Times, but I mean, there's other entities too. Yeah, well, some candidates, some rumored candidates have backed out already said we're not going to run. Do they know something that we that we don't from you? No, they, they don't. So uh, I'm focused on what we're doing. We'll make the decision at the right moment, and it will be the right decision. Great final question. Yeah, thanks a million. Okay, <laughs> take care.